secretaries, de deputy permanent secretaries, heads of departments, senior administrative officers, and all other related grades. On behalf of the Director General, Ministry of the Public Service, and the Director, Learning and Development Directorate, welcome to our workshop, Understanding the Legislative Drafting Process. This workshop is a collaboration with the Ministry of the Public Service, sorry, the Ministry of the Public Service, Learning and Development Directorate, and the Office of the Chief Parliamentary Council. I am your moderator, Alison Bess Sullivan, Senior Human Resource Officer at the Learning and Development Directorate, Ministry of the Public Service. With me in the background is my producer, Laura Taylor, Senior Human Resource Officer, also here from the Learning and Development Directorate. These online workshops are essentially a part of our future. Therefore, as we begin this informative session, the protocols and ground rules for this presentation for this presentation are as follows. Kindly mute your microphone and disable your video. Pause and or minimize distractions as much as possible. This presentation will be presented in two segments. The legislative cycle of enactments and the preparation of drafting instructions. Please note that you will be able to post your questions to the presenter at intervals throughout the presentation via the chat option. This chat option can be seen on the bottom of your screen. We are recording this workshop session and it will be made available to you via our YouTube channel. As we wrap up, you will be invited to complete our participation feedback form using the link that will be placed in the chat towards the end of the presentation. Now it's time to meet our presenters. Our presenters today are Ms. Sean Rain Bell, Chief Parliamentary Counsel Acting, and Mr. Shaquille Newton, Legislative State Counsel, Office of the Chief Parliamentary Counsel. Ms. Bell was admitted to the bar in Barbados as an attorney at law in 2022 and have been attached to the office of the Chief Parliamentary Council as a legislative drafter for 20 years. She was appointed to the post of Deputy Chief Parliamentary Council on December 1, 2020 and is currently acting in the post of Chief Parliamentary Council since April 3, 2023. Ms. Bell has extensive experience in drafting laws on data protection, cybercrime, electronic transactions, tax law, criminal law, construction law, administrative law, international law, and international business. With a master's in legislative drafting from the University of the West Indies, Ms. Bell has presented the office represented, sorry, the office of the CPC at workshops, seminars, and meetings at the local, regional, and international level on multiple occasions. Ms. Bell has made valuable contributions to the development of the Office of the Chief Parliamentary Council and is a member of the Commonwealth Association of Legislative Council. Mr. Shaquille Newton is an attorney at law admitted to practice law in Barbados in 2018. He currently serves as Legislative State Council in the Office of the Chief Parliamentary Council. He holds a Bachelor of Laws with honors from the Cave Hill Campus, University of the West Indies, and a Legal Educator Education Certificate sorry, from the U Wooden Law School. Additionally, he holds a Master of Law in Corporate and Commercial Law from the University of the West Indies. In 2021, in recognition of his leadership skills and academic attributes, Shaquille was awarded a Chevron Scholarship from the Government of the United Kingdom. 
on this scholarship, he pursued and was awarded with distinction, a Master of Law in drafting legislation, regulation, and policy from the University of London. Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. Shaquille's scholarly work in the area of legislative drafting and legisprudence is published in the European Journal of Law Reform. He is a member of the Commonwealth Association of Legislative Council and Statute Law Society of England and Wales. At this time, I now hand over into the capable hands of Ms. Sean Bell and Mr. Shaquille Newton. Over to you. Good morning, all. Um, the greeting um, protocol having been observed. Um, welcome to this workshop in which we are um, discussing two uh, specific topics, um, the legislative cycle of enactments and the drafting of um, the the preparation of drafting instructions. My name is Sean Rainbell, um, and I am the Chief Parliamentary Counsel Acting. At this point, um, I will just indicate that the Chief Parliamentary Counsel's Office is responsible for the drafting of legislation in Barbados but we also provide legal advice in relation to that process. And that would pro advice would be given to the ministries, to departments, to units, to statutory corporations. We also make appearances at various meetings, including in parliament to give um, explanations as to how legislation would work. So without further ado, if um, you can just give me one moment, we will start the presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, again. So we will begin the presentation um, dealing with the legislative cycle of enactment. And you may be curious as to what is the legislative cycle? Well, that entails the procedure that is applicable to an enactment um, being brought into operation. And the legislative cycle of an enactment depends on the type of enactment that you are dealing with. So we looked at section two of the Interpretation Act, which defines an enactment as referring to an act or a statutory instrument. Now, an act is the primary legislative embodiment of the government's will on a particular subject. And an act begins its life as a bill. And at the end of the legislative cycle, uh, that bill will become an act of parliament. So the bill, therefore, provides the legislative architecture of the field of law which you would be discussing Usually it would have preliminary um, provisions dealing with the short title, the interpretation section, which deals with the definitions, maybe an application or purpose section. Then you would have um, substantive provisions on the field of law that you're speaking to. 
and then you may have offence provisions as well as final provisions um, which will speak to the making of regulations or other statutory instruments and then a commencement um, provision. But basically it, it sets up the basic architecture for how the bill um, or how the act when it is um, passed will operate. As it relates to statutory instrument, um, the statutory instrument is usually made under the authority um, of a section of a particular act. So that section would usually empower a particular functionary to make that essay. And if you would take into consideration section two of um, the Interpretation Act, it states that an essay can refer to an order or a warrant other than and an order made or a warrant issued by a court, a notice, a scheme, rule, regulation, or bylaw. So as you can see, there are a number of different essays. But what is important to remember is that the essay is um, a law that is birthed from the primary act. So that is very important to remember. Here now, um, we will lay out the steps for the legislative cycle of a bill. And I'm just laying them out um, step by step so that you can see them in diagram form. And basically, you just go through the steps in their summary form as you can see on the screen. So the first step is the formulation of policy by the pilot ministry. The second is the instructions to CPC via cabinet paper and cabinet decision. The third, preparation of the draft bill by CPC. The fourth, pilot ministry's approval of the draft bill and a request for AG certificate. Five, the grant of the AG certificate. Six, the submission of a bill to the cabinet for approval to introduction into parliament. Seven, the submission of the bill to Parliament, that's the House of Assembly and the Senate. Eight, after the, the um, bill has passed, then it will um, go on to the President for her assent. And then the final stage is the printing of the Act in the Official Gazette. So in relation to these steps now, um, we will go into the more granular discussion. So the first step then is the formulation of policy. And it is just very important to point out that it is the specific responsibility of the ministry piloting the bill to generate the policy um, in relation to the law it's supposed to govern or the area it is supposed to govern. And sources can have... Um, there's a number of sources for um, the formulation of policy, and we'll go through a few of them now. So as you can see, they can arise from ideas generated in response to a particular event, objectives from a current political manifesto, suggestions received from the public, and reports from consultants. Now we go on to the second part of the steps um, in the legislative cycle. And that is the formulation of the policy um, where the ministry prepares and submits a, a cabinet paper which details the policy. Um, so that cabinet paper will feature all the necessary information that will be required by the legislative drafting team in order to do the do the per, re, the specific legislation, and of course, um, it would be followed by a cabinet decision that will affirm the same. Miss Bell, yes, we have a question in the chat before you move on. Mr. Payne is wondering, is there a standard format for the policy document? 
Yes, yeah, so that will be addressed in the second presentation on the drafting of the instructions. But um, I thank you for the enthusiasm. It means that you're you're very interested. <laughs> yes. So we'll deal with that in the in the in the second discussion. Any more questions? Not at this time. Not at this time. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. So we move on to the next step, which is the preparation of the draft bill and this is the third part so having received the draft instructions from the cabinet paper that would usually have specific um, direction to CPC to draft we would then proceed with the preparation and this drafting process can also include um, the consultation with um, stakeholders once the bill has been prepared. It would be sent to the Ministry for Review and Approval, of course. But then this is the opportunity also within this step to include consultations with stakeholders who could be potentially um, affected by the proposed bill. Um, the ministry um, then having reviewed and completed their consultations will then look at the composition of the bill and approve on file in writing. And on approval, the ministry will request the attorney general certificate. So now we will move on to the submission of the bill for um, the attorney general certificate. So when the um, file is sent um, to the CPC, they will review and the CPC will approve and then prepare a minute to the AG um, indicating that the ministry has approved of the bill and that it is for his submission, it's his for his consideration. Um, in requesting his certificate that the bill may be submitted to the cabinet. On approval, the AG will grant his certificate to the bill. And then the bill um, will be attached to the file and returned to CPC. In the fifth step, preparation for the submission of a bill to Parliament, this, the CPC um, will send the um, bill that has been certified by the AG to the Ministry, and the CPC will also issue an electronic copy via email. The Ministry will then prepare the requisite number of copies of the bill for Parliament. And then the next step is the submission of the bill to Parliament. And it is first submitted to the House of Assembly. And you can see the steps in terms of readings. And then once it goes through um, those readings, on the third reading, then it would be passed by the House and signed by the Clerk and the Speaker. And then it will proceed to the Senate. The Senate will then have the three readings. And on the third reading, the bill will be passed in the Senate and then it will be signed by the clerk and then the Senate and the clerk of the parliament. Yeah, so this is a review of the same process. So just bear with me. Now on to the second, the seventh step, which has to do with the assent of the president. So having passed the how the um in parliament, then the the act will then be sent to the president for her assent. And the interpretation act um, chapter one just um, speaks to some of the formalities. 
So just going through the date of the passing of every act shall be taken to be the date on which the president has signed it um, in token of his assent or her assent. Um, and section 15 to the president's assent and the day, month, year thereof shall be inscribed on every act immediately above the year and the number of the act and such inscription as shall be taken to be part of the act. The next step and final step is to have the act then published in the official gazette um, and section 16, one of the interpretation act um, states specifically that an act must be printed in the official gazette. And this is very important um, because that is the only way that it would be um, operational. So I don't know if there are any questions, but um, just in yes, terms we do of have one question, Miss Bell. Yes, please. Sorry, we <laughs> have one question, Miss Bell, <laughs> in the question. chat. Why yes, is the bill read so many times, Miss Bert Brewster? Would like to know <laughs> why is the bell the bill sorry read so many times? Um, yes. So usually it is um to make sure that there it covers all the salient areas that it should um it also gives up op um opportunity to pick up any errors um that may be there because then there may be um there would be an opportunity then to change the bill on the floor and so that gives um, some opportunity then for corrections to be made. Um, and then also it gives the proper ventilation um, in relation to debate. So those are some of the reasons that inform um, the way that they read it. But the way that they read it um, would not be in the way that you would think of, but usually um, if you listen to a debate, you would hear um, the the um, the announcement in which um, it would say, you know, does the the section one stand par and so on, and then if that is so, then they move on to the next section. So it's not a um, in a a kind of literal way, but more. Um, to make sure that all the salient things are there. And as I said before, there's also the opportunity to address any errors on the floor. Okay, we have a couple more questions for you. What happens if the app is said to be listed in the Gazette, but persons are still unable to retrieve it? That what happens if it's listed in the Gazette, in but the not Gazette. able to retrieve yes. it? Yes. The Gazette, yes. So, so this the thing is, is that um, you know, it's printed by the government printery. So you could have the op the the option of obtaining it from the printery. Okay. There's another question here from Mr. Boyce. In step two, are the instructions issued to CPC drafting instruction, or are there instructions to draft a bill? Do you need me to repeat that? I think I think you may need to repeat. Um, okay. Yes, go ahead. Mr. Boyce is asking in step two, are mm -hmm. the instructions issued to CPC drafting instruction or are there instructions to draft a bill? Right. So the thing is, this is, it's actually both. It is an instruction to CPC to draft the bill. Okay. I hope that answered your question, yeah. Mr. Boyce. Ms. Harris is also asking, can you explain the process of procl sorry, proclamation? The proclamation. A proclamation, okay. sorry. So, yes. All right. So, um, in the second presentation, um, you will touch on the procedure for the, for the essays, but... Um, or the second part of this presentation, you touch, touch on the essays, but I will indicate that that is the typical procedure. Um, proclamations don't follow 
the typical procedure, they are a bit on their own. So yes, you will start with the formulation of the policy, quote unquote, by settling on the time at which the um, the legislation um, in mind is to come into operation by proclamation, right? And then the citation of the um, authority would be given and all of that would be put into the cabinet paper and then the cabinet paper would then have the specific instruction to CPC to draft the proclamation. Um, when then the we get the file, we, we do the proclamation, which is a, a statutory instrument, and um, that will include the authority for which um, there is the commencement, um, as well as the date that the particular um, act is supposed to come into operation. Um, it will then go for, once the, the ministry has approved, of course, it will then go to the AG for his certificate. But here's where there is a departure. It will then be sent um, forward by the ministry to State House for the president to meet under her public view. So that is the departure. Um, so I hope that answers the question. Okay, so we have two more questions in the chat. Yes. Mrs. Richards would like to know, is it the ministry who will have to drive the process through parliament or is it the role of CPC? Yes, yeah, so the ministry is the one that um, pilots the um, bill through parliament. So that would be through your minister who would make a, a statement in relation to it. So CPC does not really have standing in parliament in that way. We would be invited for to give um, advice if, if invited to. Um, and sometimes we're also involved in the parliamentary process through the joint select committee meetings. Um, that's the meeting meetings between uh, members from the House and members of the Senate when they go through a bill and do some analysis. But it is the ministry that um, and the minister that would then make a presentation in relation to the bill and would be driving the bill through Parliament. Okay, another participant would like to know how they can be guided on how to develop policy. Um, well, I mean, the the next presentation on the drafting of instructions um, would give that guidance, but the office also provides a guide on the preparation and enactment of legislation. Um, so usually that document is passed out at um, the uh, main um, PS meetings, but also when requested, we would, we would distribute it. And um, most ministries should have a copy um, of that document. Okay. Miss Deborah Goodrich is asking, after printing in the Gazette, what circumstances would stop the SI from being implemented? She's asking because another government agency informed her that they got a copy of their new SI from the official Gazette, but it is not yet implemented. It is not yet implemented. Yes. So they published it in the official gazette and it's not yet implemented. Yeah, that 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 would be um yeah, that's a bit of a strange one there. Um Miss Dowage may need to explain a little bit more. Yeah, you may if yeah, she can you... unmute and she can ask yeah. you that question. You can have a conversation. Miss mm -hmm. Dowage? Yes. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Um, this actually happened, and the legislate the essay I'm talking about is an essay from. I was told that they have a new essay for 2021. This is something that keeps changing all the time. I don't want to call the department name. But it keeps changing all the time. So they have a new one, a 2021 one. And they said it came. When they checked Paramount's website, everything was finished in 2022. But when they asked them to see it, 
because we are quoting the old one now. So I asked to see mm -hmm. the new one, and I was told that it is not yet implemented. They have a new one, but it's not yet implemented. So when you said, like, um, the printing e gazette is the end point, mm -hmm. I was kind of stunned mm -hmm. as to well, this could not be implemented at Century Game in 2022. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so well, I mean, know, but the, but the thing, the, thing is, yeah. the thing is, the thing, yeah, sorry, the, the thing is, is that it is that the printing in the official cassette is, in fact, the end point. Um, and then, to me, what is it sounding like is that there was a subsequent um, essay that would have taken over the first one. Is that what happened? I'm not sure. I don't know where yeah, because... but we could be used there. But that's what a senior official in that department told me that there's a new one, but it's not yet implemented. But they got a copy no, from that. <laughs> Yeah, no, that 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 sounds um quite strange and may also be a situation where the facts of it I would have to to um see for myself in order to mm. give. But um, what you're describing sounds a bit strange to me. Um, but the the fact of the matter is that um once it's printed, then it is supposed to be operational. Okay. All right. Thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. No problem. Yeah. Thank you, CPC. The questions are coming in to you. Okay. Is this the same cycle or process for amending legislation? Ms. Mary, um, like to know. Yes, pretty much. So, but it's basically that when you do the cabinet paper, you would then identify the piece of legislation that you would want to have amended. Um, there are times where you would give um, recommendations as to how it should be amended. And um, and all of that would be included in the cabinet paper, and then this the the cycle will be um, as outlined previously. Okay, Mr. Boyce, he has a follow up question. He's asking when the cabinet approves the policy, does the ministry prepare drafting instructions to send to CPC, or do the drafting instructions have to be sent to cabinet for? approval first so the when you send when you send your cabinet paper it will have the drafting instructions included in it right for the for the cabinet to consider and then once they once they've considered then in in there would be produced a cabinet decision that would um, give the instruction for um, CPC to draft and to and and that in, in approves of the particular policy um, spoken to. So in the cabinet paper itself um, that is followed up by the cabinet decision, there's a paragraph that speaks to the fact that the cabinet approves of the of the policy articulated therein and that gives a then it, there's another paragraph that speaks to the direction to CPC to draft the legislation that will bring that particular policy into operation. Okay. Mr. Mark Trotman is asking oh, yes, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Okay, Mr. Mark Trotman Trotman is yes. asking, yes. He's still a bit uncertain of the pro proclamation versus the president's assent, and he wants you to clarify. Hi, hello, good morning. Yeah, I'm just trying to see. Hello? Yes, we're here. We're we're back on. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um 
Yes, um, so I missed the, the question from Mr. Trotman as asked. Could you repeat? Yes, Sorry certainly. Um, he said he was a bit uncertain of the proclamation mm -hmm. versus the president's assent. And he wants to clarify. Right. So, all right. So a proclamation is basically an essay which speaks specifically to when um, a piece of legislation will be commenced. So for instance, in um, an act, there, it would, there sometimes appears a provision that says that the, the act will come into operation on a date fixed by proclamation. So the proclamation then is the essay that is prepared um, that contains that um, commencement date and when that um, proclamation then is um, given the public seal then the act will come into operation officially. The president's assent is a part of the formalities in relation to um, authenticating the enactment process. So the, um, the, the president assent happens, it's a step after the passing of the legislation in parliament. So after passing, um, after the bill passes in Parliament and becomes an act, then it is sent to the president for her to, to give her assent. So that, that step, that assent then would be given. And so that is how it is different from a proclamation. Is there... A Hello? Yes, sorry about this. They can hear you? Okay. Yes, Ms. Bell. Yes. Yes, please. Yes, so yes. In the essence yes. of time, I'm going to ask you one more question before we um, move on. Um, how many copies must be prepared yes, to send to Parliament? Right, so that is dictated by the numbers um, in Parliament. So it would shift... Um, depending on the numbers. Okay. So with the, the yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we, can we can move on. on to the next part of, of the presentation. Mm -hmm. So this is the same presentation on the legislative cycle, but we're now going to move on to the um, legislative cycle of a statutory instrument. Yes. So we can go through the steps um, in the diagram in relation to the legislative cycle of a statutory instrument. And this is typical, the, typical, um, the typical procedure. Um, like the bill, you would have the formulation of the policy. Um, and that usually is set out in a cabinet paper and cabinet decision. And then it will be sent to CPC for preparation. Um, then once the, uh, the um, ministry approves of that essay, then it will be approved by the ministry and then the ministry would make a request for the AG certificate. Um, then there will be the obtaining of the AG certificate subject to the cabinet's approval. The next step will be to um, have the relevant functionary make the essay. So that's usually with the signing. Then the next step, so sets, it's 6A and a 6B, that speaks to um, a different, a different set of steps where the SI may be subject to affirmative and negative resolution. So we'll deal with it um, in greater detail later, but basically the affirmative resolution is where um, it must be approved in, um, by both houses of parliament and in this negative resolution, it must be laid before each house for 40 days and it shall be annulled if there is an objection during that time. And then the next step would be the printing of the essay in the official gazette. So we will now go into um, the granular um, part of the steps. 
first being the formulation of policy um, in relation to statutory instrument. And like the bill, it is the ministry's responsibility for the formulation of policy in relation to SA, but that power is um, restricted by the enabling provision of the act, um, which will state usually um, the statutory instrument that can be made, the functionary that can make it, and the subject matter to which the statutory instrument can address. So that if that subject cannot be dealt with um, within that listing, then um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to make the essay. Um, so we'll move on to the next step. Instructions to the office of the CPC. So the ministry will prepare the cabinet paper and submit to um, cabinet for approval um, of the making of the instrument by the particular functionary. Most of the time it is the minister, but there can be another um, functionary such as a commission. Um, the drafting of the instrument will be done by CPC. Let me just go into the fact that the um, office will prepare the SI based on the instructions in the cabinet paper. The draft SI will be sent to the ministry for approval. And then the ministry would indicate its approval of the particular essay and request the um, attorney general certificate. The next step has to do with submitting of the essay to the attorney general. And of course, then it would be like the bill where it's sent to the CPC um, when the ministry indicates the approval of the essay and there's a request made for the AG certificate. Uh, the drafter will review the instrument, submit the um, reviewed statutory instrument to CPC for review. And then once that review is completed, um, then um, the there will be a minute to the AG seeing um, a bit of a uh, departure there should be essay, but there'll be references to the cabinet paper, the ministry's additional instructions, the approval of the draft um, instrument, and the request for the AG certificate, um, and it, that the certificate will indicate that an instrument is in order for the approval of the cabinet. The Attorney General, if he approves of the statutory instrument, grant the certificate. And then um, it will be submitted um, on file to the Cabinet for approval. The approved essay will then return to CPC. And then um, CPC will send the instrument um, to the Ministry in hard copy on parchment to the Ministry. In the making and commencement, the, minis the ministry will make the statutory instrument. Um, the minister will make the statutory instrument and sign, and the instrument will come into operation on the date specified in the instrument or on the date the statutory instrument is published in the official gazette. Oh, okay, I'm sorry about this. Just a bit of a glitch here. Just one moment. Yes. Um, we now come to where the SI um, is subject to negative or affirmative resolution. So if it is for um, affirmative resolution, then um, that will mean that it will not come into operation until it is affirmed by a resolution of both houses in Parliament. And that can be found in Section 41.5 of the Interpretation Act. In terms of the negative resolution, that will be where um, the essay is laid before both houses um, 
and then if there's no objection um, it will be made but that laying um, has to be for the statutory period which would be um, the 40 days So we come to okay. the end of that first presentation um, dealing with the legislative cycle. But if there are any questions, I can entertain them now. Yes, Ms. Bell, as we wait for those questions to come in, Mr. Ronald Chapman, he's asking, can I provide comparable legislation from other countries to speed things along? Um, so... That is um, going to be dealt with in the preparation of drafting instructions, which is the next one. But just to give the one-off answer, um, it can be done, but not as a supplement to um, narrative instructions. They can be provided as um, part of the appendices um, to the cabinet paper. And we'll discuss that um, in full detail in the next presentation on the preparation of drafting instructions. Good. We're still waiting on any more questions. Any burning questions okay. for our participants? Is there a difference between an order and an SI? An order is an SI. So um, if you remember the beginning of the presentation, when we were dealing with enactments and then the definition of a statutory instrument. A statutory instrument then um, is basically could be a number of instruments. It can be an order, it can be a notice, um, it, it can be a warrant not given from the court or um, there can be a bylaw. So they, they, um, we had discussed that um, earlier, but yes, an order is a, a type of SI. Okay, we have another question. Regarding other countries, how can we tell whether UK legislation still applies to Barbados? Um, well, that would be very that would be like next to non-existent at this point um and there would have been a point in time for instance in shipping where um some of the legislation from there would have been said to have um op operational um implementation here but we're moving away from that. So as an independent state, we would make our own legislation. There are rare times where we're still um, having some, some overhangers, but the, all of those would now be um, coming to the end of their life. But usually um, it would be stated explicitly in the legislation. Okay, thank you for your answers. There are no more questions in the chat at present. So you can, sorry, one more just came in. <laughs> what is the process for regulations? Well, regulations is a type of statutory instrument. So we would have just gone through the procedure for the um, enactment of an, a statutory instrument and a regulation is one of them. Okay. Yes. Miss Leslie said thanks. That's no it for now for questions. <laughs> okay. We can All proceed. Right. Yes, please. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now go into the hot pressing topic that all of you are waiting for, and that is the preparation of drafting instructions. Um, so this should be um fun and I'm sure that it would um inspire many more questions. So indeed, what are drafting instructions? And drafting instructions are a set of policy objectives um, identified by the pilot ministry, which would require translation into legislation by the legislative drafter. Um, those objectives would be set out in a cabinet paper prepared by the, the pilot ministry and um, submitted to cabinet for its approval. 
the cabinet paper will contain the express instruction to CPC to draft the legislation as required to achieve the said policy objectives. Um, the cabinet paper would be accompanied by a cabinet decision confirming the same. So just to go through the purpose of the drafting instructions. Um, so some BIS bills will be simple and standard form and be drafted quite easily, but others um, may take months or even years to draft. And um, it is against this backdrop that having written instructions provides for the institutional memory to be created on the particular matter. And also it um, verifies what the legislative objectives would be so that there would um, be an elimination of um, specific disputes between um, the CPC and the pilot ministry. And also in terms of providing institutional memory, then um, if any person then were to, if there was a change in personnel, they could always go back to those drafting instructions as written um, for guidance as to how, what, a policy, what policy objectives should be followed. So just in terms of the drafting process, just a little diagram. Um, again, the formulation of the policy, the preparation of the drafting instructions by the pilot ministry, the receipt of the drafting instructions by the office of the CPC. Um, then there's an analysis of the drafting instructions by the legislative drafter. Um, usually that would entail um, considering the instructions doing a legislative plan and then drafting accordingly. So if you were um, trying to tell a story, usually you would have uh, um, a kind of template. Um, and similarly with um, legislation, usually the legislative drafter would create a plan that would um, inform how that legislation would look based on the consideration of the drafting instructions. Um, then you would see that the drafting undertaken will be done in accordance with the drafting instructions, and then the legislation would be produced and submitted to the pilot ministry for consideration. So now we come to the role of the ministry in relation to the drafting instructions, and there is a four-pronged kind of um, understanding. So in the drafting process and instructions process, of course, you would appreciate that the, it is the ministry's um, responsibility to generate the policy, but it's supposed to be an interactive and collaborative process. Um, and at an early stage, the drafter can be um, contacted um, with particular particulars and um, direct responsibility for the legislation. So there should be contact between the drafter and the main person who is going to be providing um, a lot of the information in, that is needed in order to clarify the policy. Um, you can have a pre-drafting meeting where there would be a discussion of the approach and the ministry should make itself available for consultation um, with the drafter so that there would be clarification on the information on the instructions so that you can produce the most, um, the most efficient draft. Then there's the role of CPC and the primary role of CPC, of course, is to um, transform the government's policy into legislation. But there are a number of other functions that we um, perform in this process. Uh, we provide a perspective on the practicality of a legislative proposal. Um, that is, you know, to see whether it really is something that should be addressed by policy, by legislation. We look into the constitutionality of a legislative proposal. 
the need for amendments of existing laws, need to repeal um, existing laws, you need for subsidiary legislation. So that is whether it needs regulations or an order or a notice in order to give um, particular legislation full operation um, so that you would be looking at the legislative proposal to see how that that requested piece of legislation would function within the existing um, statutory and legal framework. Additionally, we also um, identify possible implementation problems. So um, sometimes and one of the more um, popular ones is financial and resource implications. Um, uh, but where the, the problems are financial, then those matters should be resolved with the Ministry of Finance. Um, are there any questions at this point of the presentation? Yes, we do have one yes, question please. from Mr. Payne. Yes, if consultants are assisting the ministry, would you also meet with those consultants? Yes, I think he's we, referring we to would yes? be willing. Sorry, um, right. So sometimes the the ministry may recruit in the drafting of their instructions a consultant to assist with the, the preparation of those instructions. Um, CPC would be willing to um, meet with the consultants to see what their um, thought process would have been in informing um, the policy. Thank you, Mr. Payne, for that question. Are there any more questions for this segment, the preparation of drafting instructions? Yes, we have one more. Should stakeholders' input take place before the drafting instructions? Should take stakeholder input take place before the drafting instructions? Yes, yeah, so it, it would be ideal for the policy as devised by the ministry to um, be subjected to um, consultation with stakeholders. Um, so that you can see what specific issues may come up in relation to implementation, administration, and the like um, before the drafting instructions are um, composed. That is the that is the ideal, but sometimes you actually do it um, in the in the middle, and um, sometimes even near the end where you have the joint select committee um, type mechanisms in par parliament. I mean, at that stage, that is very, very late. Um, and then there would be a substantive amount of um, gymnastics that has to be done in order to address the issues. But the ideal place is before the drafting instructions are composed so that you, in, you, you, you speak to your stakeholders and see how... Um, the proposed policy would affect them. And then those comments can also be distilled into the instructions themselves in the cabinet paper. So I don't think I, hopefully that would have provided a fulsome answer. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bell. There are no more questions in the chat at this time. If you have any questions, yes, participants, yes. please feel okay. free to ask our presenters. Does CPC recommend a yeah. structure to this consultation? Okay, so there are a number of um, approaches that I have seen over the years, but one of them um, that I find particularly effective is if you set up a kind of committee that, um, and on that committee, all the stakeholders then would be asked to appear and then consider the particular um, policy um, paper as drafted by the, by the ministry. So I, I have found that that has been particularly effective because it provides a forum for um, the, legis the, the legislative proposal to be um, ventilated and um, potential issues addressed. 
Okay, Mr. Payne is asking. You're welcome, Ms. Graham. Mr. Payne is asking in your experience, what is the benchmark time frame to get in the matter through the process? So he's asking okay. what is the benchmark? The benchmark, um, all right. So the the thing is, is that th that is hard to identify because some some pieces of legislation are quite simple and some are more complicated. So that um, typically like with a, a statutory instrument, which would be probably simpler, um, something like a one page order or so, um, usually it could take um, a, a two week period. And that is taking into account that you have to, to be dealing with cabinet first and then the process second and then going back again um, before it is made. So, um, but then with a larger, larger uh, piece, you know, that, that can take longer. It can take months um, and sometimes years, but um, that is depending on the complexity of the matter. But for, for a bill, you're, you're really, for instance, um, of the simpler type, um, it, it can be um, easier in the three three week period. So the I, I would be speaking to minimum standards, but most of the time that doesn't really happen because of intervening factors. Okay, we have one more question. Is it the responsibility of the pilot ministry to organize or set up the review committee who will ventilate any issues surrounding the pro proposed legislation? Yes, it would be the responsibility of the pilot ministry to convene such a committee. Okay, uh, Ms. Graham is asking again, where can we find consolidated legislation? Where can that be found? When you say consolidated legislation, you mean um, with all of the amendments incorporated into one? Ms. Graham. One, two. Because that has, a, said yes. that has a, a specific term. <laughs> right, okay. So, um, Usually the consolidation would have been found in the blue volumes. But what has happened is that um, the consolidation stops up to 2008. After that period, then you would have to rely on the annuals, which has the annual set of um, legislation in a year, um, whether it is an essay or whether it is an act. So then you would have to depend on those. Um, this is primarily because um, we don't have in place the law revision com commissioner um, to facilitate that consolidation. So um, right now you would be you would be relying on um, those separate those separate annuals. In your experience what are the potential constitutional issues that may arise? May arise from? May it arise from? from? Oh, okay. Yes. Well, then you need to. to Miss Evelyn, do you want to on, on mute and ask that question? Uh, from the proposed legislation. So, I'm looking at your policy in relation to the drafting. So, it says. Um, legal issues, including any constitutional issues or other factors which could give rise to legislation, to litigation, sorry. So what are examples of that? If you have any. Of, of the type of constitutional issues that may come up in terms of instructions? Yes. Okay, so for instance, yeah. Oh, right. Okay. All right. So that, that provides better content. Okay. So for instance, you may find that a policy may run afoul of the fundamental rights and freedoms of persons um, set out in chapter 
chapter 11, I believe, yes, of the Constitution. So that, um, you know, and most of the time that is what it what it entails, some kind of um, conflict with that particular part of the Constitution, in which case, you know, you would not proceed, you would have to find another way of addressing the matter. Um, that does not because we would we would be under an obligation to produce legislation that does not um conflict with the constitution and Thank in particular you. the fundamental rights of individuals yes okay so the burning question in the chat where can one okay. access the annuals okay so um some of the them are available on the Parliament website, I believe, and some are available on the um, Supreme Court website, I believe, although th that was under construction for a time. Um, usually, um, those, those documents that fill up the annuals can be um, obtained from the official gazette and um, by extension, the printery. Um, Right, so that that you can you can find that there. Miss Harris, in relation to that question, would like to know: Are these annuals up to date? Right. So, um, usually they um they would be up to date, um, to the particular year. It is it is the one that uh, that um is in the year you're in that may be slightly behind um, because you, you, as you would appreciate, it takes time to put on the um, legislation as um, it is enacted. And so there, there may be a slight lag there, but otherwise um, the annuals for the year, they should be complete. Okay, she's asking that question because she states the ones on the Supreme Court are only up to 2015. Right. So then the thing is, is that you may try the Parliament website, um, but in terms of the full uh, complete set, um, we're still working on a website to, to deal with that. Okay. Ms. Brewster would like to know, what is the website for the Official Gazette? And are we moving away from printing? Okay, so the website for the official Gazette, I don't have that um, to hand at the moment, but um, a Google search will yield it um, usually. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. And, uh, right. Um, yes, and then there's the second part of the question. Um, sorry, I lost. And she part. said she asks. She said, and we are moving away from printing. Yes, we are. We're moving yes, away from yes, printing. We are. We're so she wants to, to find that website. Yes. Yeah, so um, a, a Google search should yield it because I don't have the, the website to hand um, at, the, at the moment. Thank you, Ms. Burt Brewster, right, right. for your right. question. But you, you, yeah, but um, the, the Gazette can be found on the JS website too, huh? So... They can go there. Okay. There are no more further questions in the chat. Yes. So um, we go on to the second part of the of the second presentation, which deals with the content of drafting instructions. And usually good drafting instructions should set out background information. Um, background information information including the problem which the legislation is intended to solve um, and what the ministry um, wishes to happen, the desired outcome. The legislation should set out um, the why the desired outcome cannot be achieved without the legislation, so that's the mischief. It should also, they should also set out how the ministry thinks the law can be changed in order for it to happen, and that is the remedy. Um, the existing law on the subject should be provided. Any legal issues that need to be taken into account should be included. Um, the 
instructions should also speak to how the legislation will be implemented. So that um, can include the identification of who will administer the legislation and enforcement. The instructions can, will also include the consultations that have taken place within central government and affected entities. It should also include any consultation that has taken place outside of the government, public meetings, NGOs, consultations with the NGOs, professional bodies, international organizations, and other relevant stakeholders. Then it should also include the mechanics of the administration of the legislation, including the identification of regulatory bodies and how they will function. The policy should also involve, um, can also involve the imposition of tax fees and um, the collection thereof. Um, there must be a reflection though of consultations with, the fin with finance on this issue. Where the policy may involves the implementation of an international treaty, there should be details as to the status of Barbados in relation to the treaty. And um, if usually um, there should also be the inclusion of the SG's comments in relation to the treaty, that's also very important. And so at this point, I will... Um, open up for questions um, in relation to the content of um, instructions. Um, if there are no um, questions in relation to that, then we can move on to the format. So it should be noted that um, instruction should always be in written form. And this is to protect the drafter and the instructing ministry if a dispute arises as to whether the draft reflects the government's policy. It also minimizes possible negative effects of personnel change and also provides institutional memory. The format of the drafting instructions should always be in a narrative form and be in ordinary narrative prose, be written in simple English. And um, the use of technical, non-technical language um, should be used as far as possible. However, if technical terms are used, they should be defined. We now come to the favorite issue of, of many of the ministries, and that would have to do with the issue of model legislation and lay drafts. And, and it should be stated here that model legislation and lay drafts are not sufficient to constitute um, drafting instructions and will cause the following problems. And I would just invite um, my colleague, um, Legislative State Council, Mr. Shaquille Newton, to give his observations as I just put out the reasons, some of the reasons. So, Mr. Newton, um, if you if you will. Good morning. Yes. So, coming to the issue of model legislation and lay drafts, if we refer back to the definition of draft and instructions in the first place, draft and instructions are the set of policy objectives which require translation into legislation. Therefore, just submitting draft and instructions in the form of model legislation and lay drafts defeats the whole purpose of the draft and instructions. Where it gets really ticklish is that the drafter then has to go through the painstaking effort of interpreting the... Sorry, I did not realize my camera was off. Of interpreting the model legislation or lay draft, the provisions of that lay draft. 
And the danger here is that there is the possibility for the drafter to have an incorrect interpretation of the model legislation or lay draft, which is then conveyed in the final product of the legislation and would not really reflect the will of the ministry. So to prevent and safeguard against this, it is better that draft instructions are provided in the narrative form, which are easier to understand and to convey the legislative meeting intended by the ministry. And if anything, draft legislation, lay drafts and model legislation can serve as appendices to draft and instructions in narrative form. Yes, thank you, Mr. Newton. Uh, um, and of course, so the so the drafting instructions then um, in the well, the model legislation um, or the lay drafts may be submitted as appendices and serve as aid memoirs um, in relation to. Uh, um, those instructions in the narrative form. So just to go back to my original page. Yes. And thank you, Mr. Newton, for your insights. So we then move on to the appendices. And as indicated, uh, um, well, we we can start with saying first of all observing that policy papers generated by the ministry um, can be placed into the cabinet paper as appendices you can has also have reports on consultations with stakeholders um, as discussed model legislation and lay drafts can be pr produced by um, or recommended by the Law Reform Commission or international organizations or consultants to the ministry, they can put, be put as appendices. The text of international treaties and where possible travel repertoires in relation to the treaty can be included and travel repertoires are basically documents that would have informed the drafting of the treaty itself. There's also legal opinions relating to a legislative proposal prepared by the SG's chambers, the Mr. General's chambers. And of course, no, um, I open the floor for questions in relation to um, the formatting of um, the instructions. If there are no um, questions in relation to that part of the presentation, we'll move on then to frequently required substantive and administrative provisions. And we just picked um, these types of these, these come up uh, more often than not. Um, and basically uh, what we're speaking to would be legislation and le licensing and re registration regimes, statutory corporations, and tribunals. So um, in putting this forward, basically what we are um, identifying is are those issues for which um, the drafting instructions should address. So in relation to a licensing in system, for instance, um, the policy should provide for the licensing or registration um, authority, privileges, duties, and other attributes, attributes of licensing or registration authority, the activity to be licensed or registered, the application, in other words, who may apply and how do they apply, the processing of the application for a license or registration, the criteria for the grant of the license or, or um, registration, the duration or renewal of the license or, or registration, the appeal process in relation to the decision to be made um, in relation to a licensing or registration application, register and records of persons um, 
who are to be licensed. So for instance, um, you must identify who is to keep the register and the particulars that need to be keeping kept in the register. You'd have the enforcement of your requirement to possess a license or to be registered in um, the particular activity. So um, will it be enforced by an admin penalty or will it go to the to the point of being enforced by um, a criminal penalty? Those are the kinds of things that you would look into. Or um, is it um, a situation where you would pay, pay a fee or is it a situation where the license can be revoked or suspended? Those types of uh, mechanisms. Um, and again here, suspension and revocation of license, you should provide policy on that. The next um, more most popular um, type of um, situation where legislation would be required is where you're setting up a statutory corporation. And if you're setting up that corporation, then the policy that needs to be provided um, um, would be as follows. The constitution management and functions of the corporation. You need to provide policy in relation to the financial provisions and the accountability of the corporation. So um, most of the time then you would be indicating that it would have to, for instance, be in conformity with um, certain accounting standards um, and record keeping standards as um, set out in PFM, for instance. Um, you would have to um, state the administrative powers and procedures of the corporation. You'd have to identify the procedural provisions concerning the um, operations of the board or the governing body of the corporation. Um, where applicable provisions for replacement of an existing corporation by a new corporation. So sometimes you need to establish a new corporation, but you have to transfer the obligations, both legal and otherwise, um, from the old corporation to the new. And so therefore you would have to provide um, certain details as to what needs to be transferred. In terms of setting up a tribunal, it should address the composition of a tribunal, the number of members, the qualifications of the members, the chairman, the duration of membership, for example. It should deal with the functions of a tribunal. It should do with the powers of a tribunal. It should do, deal with the procedure of the tribunal and the appeal process of the tribunal. So those are the policy um, requirements that you would need to have addressed in the cabinet paper um, to form the instructions to CPC in order to draft a tribunal. And these are provided for as examples of the kind of detail that you need to get into when you are designing your drafting instructions. And at this time, we are at the end of the second presentation. And I thank you for hearing, um, for your attention. And if there are any questions, you can raise them now. Thank you. As we wait for those questions to come in, Ms. Bell, just to recap on two questions before, just to reinforce, can you please repeat the difference between an order and an SI? An order is a statutory instrument or an essay. An order is an essay. So an essay um, is a stop type of statutory instrument and an order is a type of statutory instrument. Okay. And can you yes. explain again what is the process for the regulations? Right. So do you as we await those questions that come in. Yeah, so yes, go ahead. Right, so right, so a regulation is a type of statutory instrument. And so the procedure would have been outlined in the first presentation. You would start with the formulation of the policy, 
the policy would then be distilled into a cabinet paper. The cabinet paper will contain the instructions to CPC to draft the um, essay. Um, then it would be sent to CPC to draft. The CPC would draft and then send it to the ministry for them to review and then give their approval. Once they've given their approval, they would ask for the AG certificate, the CPC, um, and submit it to CPC. The CPC would review and then submit it to the AG. The AG would then review and then uh, with a view to submitting it to cabinet um, for um, the approval. Once the approval is given, then um, it will be given to the ministry for the minister to make. That is um, the general um, part of it and then it will be printed. If it is subject to affirmative or negative resolution, um, in terms of the affirmative, it has to be um, given um, affirmative resolution by both houses. If it is negative, it has to be laid in Parliament for 40 days. Um, and if there's no obligation, then um, it will come into operation. Um, and of course, the essay must be um, published in the official Gazette for it to come, be fully operational. Okay, and so thank that you. would be, it's... yes. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. That's okay. Miss Lisa Graves would like to know where the Parent Act has provided for registration, has provided for registration or licensing. Does the drafting instructions have to reflect consultation with Ministry Finance Ministry of Finance, given registration fees will be charged? Yes. So if anytime you're dealing with the imposition of a tax or a fee or duty or the like, then you would have to have um, a reflection of the views of um, the Ministry of Finance on that matter. Okay, thank you. Mr. Culp, sorry, Lynn Culpepper. <laughs> What are some of the main issues that may delay the drafting of legislation? What are some of the main okay. issues? Uh, the, some of the main issues surround um, incomplete or inadequate um, instructions so that um, the instructions are somehow unclear. You may have submitted a model um, legislation and it's the bare model without any um, narrative um, information in relation to the policy. Um, sometimes there's inadequate consultation with appropriate bodies or um, other affected ministries. Um, there could be issues um, relating to, that, to the fact that you need to consider other pieces of legislation that you may touch and concern. There's also possible issues of um, butting against the Constitution, in which case you would have to um, revisit the approach and and move forward, um, and then move forward. So those are the types of issues that can come up. Okay, another question. Does the ministry decide via drafting instructions what should be in the app or in regulations? or does CPC make that determination? Okay, so that um, sometimes that can get a bit technical. So the thing is, is that CPC can make um, a decision about what can appear in, an, uh, in the act and what appears in um, the essay, be it regulations or an order or a notice. So, for instance, there are some procedural things to deal with the fees and the forms and so on. Those would tend to appear in um, regulations um, or subsidiary legislation or essays um, rather than in the Act. And so, therefore, CPC would make, can make that decision. But some of the time, the ministry would be aware of what they're supposed to be addressing. So, for instance, you know that you ha already have a parent act and you're seeking to do um, regulations or you're seeking to do another type of essay, then you may ask for 
um, that particular essay and then um, give instructions to that effect. So I hope that that um, provides some, some clarification. Okay, what is the process where a certain section of an ad is not proclaimed? Right, so usually that would mean that the there would it would be required that a proclamation then be done to proclaim that particular section. So you would have to go to cabinet, prepare cabinet paper to have that particular um, section proclaimed. Thank you so much. There are no more questions in the chat. Any more questions, participants, that you will need to ask our presenters? Ms. Bell and Mr. Newton, this is your time. I'll give you two minutes. <laughs> um, and, and, and just to indicate that um, Minister, Ministries, departments, um, heads, so SAOs, AOs, you are free to call the department um, to ask for guidance if you need to. Um, certainly, I have made myself available, as some of you know, um, to assisting with um, giving guidance on what can be in the drafting instructions. I won't, you won't generate the policy, but you may um, give some advice as to what can appear so that you can um, be, it can be in a better place um, when it gets to us that we can then draft the legislation with all speed. Okay, we have one so more. That is a very, yes. Sorry. Ms. Bell, we have one more question coming in. Are any examples of drafting instructions available that can be reviewed? Yes, yeah, so the, the, we provide for um, a document called the um, Guidelines on the Preparation and Enactment of Legislation. Um, so that document can be distributed. Um, where you can see the format that you can follow. Um, yes. So that's the, the main one that, that would provide the guidance. Okay, there are no more further questions at this time. But, oh, one. <laughs> Ms. Graham said one in the chat. Ms. Graham, please explain that question mark. Hi, I have one question and I can't type very fast. That's okay, you can speak. Um, does CPC give any feedback or guidance where, where ministries or departments seek to amend legislation um, because for whatever reason, one aspect is not working? Does CPC give guidance in terms of other measures that could be taken? rather than changing legislation? Well, okay, so, all right, that's, that's um, conflating two things. So in terms of um, advice in relation to amendments of legislation, yes, we can give guidance on that. Um, in relation to methodologies other than legislation, remember that our um, part, part of expertise would, have, would be on legislation. Um, so, I mean, we can point to it, but, um, right, but our, our main, our main focus in terms of our expertise would be legislation. And we do give, um, we do give guidance, um, if required in relation to, um, prospective amendments, including consequential ones to a main piece of legislation. Okay, Ms. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green for that question. Ms. Barbusa is in the chat and she's asking where can she have access to instructions? Where can she access the instructions? Okay, so there um, would have been the preparation of 
the guidelines on the preparation and enactment of legislation. Um, so that can be distributed. I suppose I can get a mailing list um, from per participants and send the document again. Um, but that document would provide guidance on the instructions. Okay, the other question is there, well, from me, <laughs> is there a website mm -hmm. you can find these instructions on or no? No, no. Okay. Okay, so there are no more further questions in the chat. So, Ms. Bell? Yeah, yes. Sorry, Please. one more question coming in. Regarding penalties for breaches of an act, where fees mm -hmm. are applicable, can the fees be changed by regulations rather than inclusion in an app? Okay, so you can make provision for fees in regulations. That is a, an, a statutory instrument or essay. Um, so that can be done. But fees can be provided for in an act in the schedule to the act, in which case then you would provide for in the act a provision that will make, um, that would empower a minister to make an order to amend that schedule, which would then amend the fees found contained therein. And so those are the two approaches that can be taken. Okay, thank you for your answer. We want to thank you, Ms. Bell and Mr. Newton. Sorry, another question has come in. <laughs> Miss, yeah. one minute, please. Is there a certain amount of time after a measure has been heard in Parliament for the legislation to be finalized? You need um, me to repeat that? Uh, well, I, I mean, to be finalized, it is that you would it would pass in the House and the Senate. So after being the the readings, um, and then it being passed, and then it being signed, um, by the relevant parties, then it would be be passed and then sent for assent, um, to the president. So I mean, there's no specific time in relation to that. It is just how long the process takes in in Parliament for that to happen. Okay. All right. As we said earlier, these this video will be placed on our YouTube channel for the participants and other persons to access. That's just for the participants' information. Okay, Miss Bell. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I'm Mr. Thank Newton, you. for this informative presentation and taking us thoroughly through the legislation drafting process in such an in-depth and concise manner. Thank you so much. We have the um, participants in the chat also thanking you for a well-presented presentation. As we wrap up, please Thank take you. one moment to offer your feedback about the workshop. To do this, Click on the link that has been placed in the chat and submit it without delay. Thank you. So you go to the chat and click on our link and we value your feedback. I'm gonna give you three minutes to fill that form out. Maybe some of you may need five, but I'll wait. Um, yes, um, can I just um, indicate that um, our, um, some of the members of staff of CPC are in on the chat as well, and um, a copy of the document that I referenced, um, guidelines on the preparation and enactment of legislation, um, has been put in the chat. So um, participants can get a copy from there. Thank you.
Okay, participants, we have now reached the end of our workshop, understanding the legislative drafting process. Join with me once more as I thank Mr. Sorry, Ms. Sean Rain Bell, Chief Parliamentary Counsel at TIN, and Mr. Shaquille Newton, Legislative State Counsel, Office of the Chief Parliamentary Counsel, for this informative session. On behalf of the Director General Human Resources and the Director of the Learning and Development Directorate, thank you for joining listening and participating. Do enjoy the rest of your afternoon.